Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's been a few weeks, but we're back. I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, things have really turned around since you and I talked last. Last time we were talking about that pathetic Chicago win, and the Flames have turned that into a four-game winning streak. Yeah, imagine the difference a trade makes. A trade and a week off. Yep. Um, well, let's let's talk about this. So the Flames had their week off, obviously. A lot happened. We will discuss that as we move forward, but let's talk about the game since then. Flames came back from the... Uh, from the break, and we're on the road, still on the road, actually, went to Boston and ended up spanking the best team in the NHL 4-1. to one. And I would say this was more of a case of Boston not playing well than Calgary playing really well. I think Calgary held their own. You know, like, they were physically engaged throughout the contest, uh, you know, highlighted by Martin Pospisil punching Brad Marchand in the face uh, and getting ejected for it. Uh, but... No, I thought the Flames played a really tight game, uh, despite, you know, like Boston when they're on, of course, like they can walk all over anybody. If Boston was at 100, it was at 90%. This would have been a very different game. Yeah, but, you know, the Flames, you know, they came in as the underdog and, you know, they gave it their full effort from the opening puck drop through the end of the game. And, you know, if the Flames are playing like that, they can beat anybody. Yep, and uh, this is we'll talk about the trade a little bit later, but just as a note of record, Andre Kuzmenko's first game is a flame and first goal is a flame. Yep, and of course, 420 in, because anybody from Vancouver, 420, hey, that works. Yeah, he, he and he looked good. I mean, he yeah. looked good. He looked good with his line mates. This did not look like a guy playing his first game with this team. No, it's like him and Huberto are long-lost buddies who've been together for like 10 years. And that same success happened uh, on Thursday when the Flames rolled into New Jersey. This is the night you and me and a whole bunch of our fans had a good time down at Bow River Brewing for our trivia night. The Flames ended up with a 5-3 win in that one. I wasn't quite sure that was going to go. It was up and down all night. But again, a good solid effort by the Flames resulted in two points. Yeah, and uh, you know, credit to um, basically uh the whole team but especially jacob markstrom for his exceptional play um in this game and you know he robbed the devils on a number of occasions where you know like they look like sure goals and yet he'd flash the leather in just the right way to keep the puck out yeah and uh i think a note here kevin rooney got his first goal of the year as a flame obviously his Second game as a flame since coming back from his injury. So that was former really nice. devil. You know, it's always nice to score on your old team. Yeah, too bad Sharon Govich didn't score. Oh, I know. Well, but I can't have them all. But you know, it, and I have to say that Kevin Rooney is now playing like the Kevin Rooney we both expected when he first arrived. It's nice a year and a half later to actually see him play like we know he can. Yeah, I mean, last year he faltered and they sent him to the American League. And I, you know, I have to imagine that was maybe a kick in the butt for him. Yeah, and then to get injured for the first several months. Because I was quite high on him when the Flames brought him in. Oh, yeah. Well, he was a very good fourth liner for the New York Rangers. and, And, you know, the wheels fell off the wagon quite a bit. And, you know, he found his way into the AHL but it's good to see that he's back with authority and you know he's playing for his next contract as well he's a free agent at the end of the year and it's important for his career to show that hey I can actually play well at this level still and again Kuzmenko on the board two games of flame two goals of flame yep just what you like to see from a fourth liner on a different team and uh, after that, the Flames go into New, New York, uh, matinee game, not even a matinee game, a morning game, because it was 11 a.m. Calgary time start, which we don't see very often. And Uyghur scores his first, his first ever hat trick as the Flames defeat the Islanders for their fourth straight win. And Matt, this makes them undefeated without Lindholm at this point. Yep. And as you know, of earlier today, the uh, Vancouver Canucks are winless with Lindholm. No, so they got one win. Their first game with Lynn home, they got a win. Yeah, I know. But, uh, yeah, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, it, it seems that he was the a bit of a problem, it seems. I'm being sarcastic, if you can't tell. We got rid of him, we got rid of Dubé, and everything's changed. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, this was... 
This was, I think, this whole week of games, some of the best Flames hockey we've seen. Definitely the best hockey this year, but I'd say some of the best Flames hockey for a while. Like this team, if you were to show me this team and you were to show me a clip of the team before the break in that Chicago game, I wouldn't believe you they were the same guys. No, like Huberdo is not the same player. No. You know, and, you know, if you can pencil him in as the addition to the Lindholm trade, you know, because, hey, he's back. <laughs> You know, uh, it's, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if, you know, if he plays like this with Kuzmenko the rest of the way, like that, that instantly be actually becomes a dangerous top line uh, instead of, uh, well, it, these are the best of the players we've got. And, you know, instead, like it, they were dangerous all week. They sure were. Um, which is a nice thing to see. Like, and one thing I do have to remark is the, it, it seems that there's been a lot of pressure relieved off of this team. Um, just based on like interviews, like you see like Huberto smiling a lot. Uh, everybody is seeming to be joking and laughing a lot more and a lot looser, which is nice to see because for as long as we can remember, this team has been like captain serious all the time. Yeah, and I think, I mean, some of that could be the personality. Kuzmenko is known for being a little more silly. Um, Same with know, Pelletier. Yeah, and and I, I don't know that Lindholm was that way, but, you know, when you win, things are going well. And if I just came back from, you know, a lot of these guys were on holidays in Cabo and Mexico and different places. If I just came back, I'd be feeling pretty good too. Yep. It's nice and, to see the guys having fun, which... You know, after a long two seasons, like it's nice to see people being happy for a change. It is for sure. And with that, Mackenzie Weger now the number one goal getting defenseman in the league. He has 15 goals, 17 assists for 32 total points. Last year, he got 31 points in 81 games. He has 32 and 52 games this year. His career high is 44. He there he's going to surpass that no problem. Yeah, unless he gets hurt, he yeah definitely. He's going to have a fifty plus point season. Yeah, and easily twenty goals plus. Yeah, and you know I mean, while maybe Huberto hasn't worked out, I'd say he's coming around. But maybe while maybe that hasn't turned out the way Flames fans wanted. Geez, we got a good piece in Mackenzie Weger. Yeah, like I would not be surprised if Weger at the end of the year did not get some votes for the Norris Trophy. Um, probably would not win it, but you know, he would be in strong consideration and, you know, perhaps if the flames do squeak into the playoffs, he might get a little bit more deference because of that. So that was actually something that our friend Kevin Olenek from the Shifts and Pucks podcast asked us as a question uh, for us to talk about is, does Weger get Norris Trophy considerations? I think he could get some votes. I don't think he comes anywhere near winning if the flames don't make it past round one. Yeah, and uh, honestly, I, I would expect him to probably be third in the voting, maybe fourth. But I'd probably say fourth. Yeah, I I can see there are too many. Western you know, like Canadian you got to you got to figure that Hughes and McCarr are definitely going to be the runaway one two, just because they're awesome and they deserve it. But you know, some three four votes definitely would make sense. Yeah, I can see maybe, a co and that's voted on by members of the Professional Hockey Writers Association. I can see maybe a couple of Western Conference guys voting for him, but I don't know. I think, we'll we'll see. I, I If they don't make the playoffs, I don't know if he, he makes it to third. Yeah, true enough. And speaking of playoffs, the Flames now put themselves back into an interesting position. They're at 55 points. Uh, 52 games played, 25 wins, 22 losses, five overtime losses for 55 total points. And the wildcard teams are tied at 58. So, Matt, we're nipping on their heels. Nashville's above us at 56. Seattle's below us at 52. The Flames have all of a sudden got themselves back into a playoff conversation. Yeah, and realistically, this team needs to treat this as a mirage. Because, like, granted, you're in a spot that you're in the proximity of a playoff spot and that's great but like you cannot confidently walk into the off season with you know Hannafin and Tanev especially and to a lesser extent guys like Rooney um that are free agents to be and not capitalize on the asset at all and you know it, it's one of those where the flames need to be strategic in what they acquire uh, to, you know, kind of replace 
the players that we've got with younger versions of themselves that maybe are not as experienced and maybe be able to plug them in, like move uh, Shillington and uh, Pahal up one line and then Erpishal up one line and then, uh, you know, uh, have the new kids come in as the third pairing or something. I think that Craig Conroy has a plan and has had a plan, you know, going into this break. I think you have to execute the same plan. And I hear a lot of people talking about tanking. I don't want this team to tank. I, I, you know, I don't think they necessarily need a top five pick this year. I think you've got to just run the course. And if you can make the playoffs with a young core, great. It's great experience for those kids. But I think, you know, you still, you can't, you can't keep the players that you thought you were going to move trying to get that playoff run. You can't acquire veterans. You need to just no, stay it, the course yeah. and see what happens. It's not like this team is a cup contender. No. Like, if they manage to get to the playoffs, that's an accomplishment on them. And great, wonderful for you. But, you know, if you get out of the first round, that's a shock. And if you go beyond the first round, you're talking like an 0304 type run or like Nashville a few years ago where it's like, uh, how did this team get here? And, <laughs> you know, it could happen, but, you know, like, let's be real, it's not going to. And so don't shoot yourself in the foot. And that's what a lot of Canadian teams end up doing is when they're in a situation like this, they don't maximize the value that they need. Arguably, that's what the Flames have done for a number of years. Yeah, like, it, and you can hearken it all the way back to, like, all of the t Canadian teams when they've been in this transitional, entering a rebuild but not phase of not capitalizing on assets and letting them walk for marginal returns or none at all. And you know, shooting themselves in the foot, which, you know, makes it just that much harder to get out of it. And, like, we saw that, especially with the Edmonton Oilers, as a specific cautionary tale, where it took them, like, 10 years to go what should have been a short rebuild into a 10-year odyssey to try and, you know, figure out how to be a team again, and when it did not need to be that way because they did not capitalize on all of the assets that they had. Yeah, and, you know, even if the Flames don't make it, if they can stay in contention there, they're still going to be a lottery team. They're still going to get an okay pick, which is what I think they need this year. Um, you know, they'll have multiple picks in the first round either way. But I think that even if they don't make the playoffs, there's something to be learned from these kids for trying your hardest, you know, getting close and battling for it. Yeah, you need the guys to be hungry, and it's a learning experience, and you want them to find that hey if i'm actually successful we can actually win games and you know okay this is what i need to do to take my game to the next level in the off season so that way instead of just missing we're actually in the playoffs or you know and, and then take what you've learned in the nhl go play for the wranglers because we're going to send you down and get a trophy there yep exactly well let's uh back the tape up i feel like i need one of those reverse uh, sound effects here. Yeah, it, you know, go with whatever random, you know, like wind <laughs> chiming. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, or like a 90s flashback card from a sitcom. Yeah. Let's go back to just for the All-Star game. And the Flames have all gone their separate ways, going on vacation. We thought we were settling in for a bit of a break. And uh, Craig Conroy had other ideas. Craig Conroy decided, you know what? We're on a break. This would be a great time to make a big trade. And he does that. Uh he traded Elias Lindholm to the Vancouver Canucks in exchange for Andre Kuzmenko, Hunter Buchnevich, uh, Yoni Yermo, a first round pick and a conditional fourth round pick, both in this year's draft. So quite a bit coming back. Um, let me ask you, I'll give them, I'll get, I'll ask your thoughts first. What were your initial thoughts and have they changed in the week since we got uh, the trade done? I thought it was a home run right off the hop, and then as I've learned more about all of the parts, it's like, how did Conroy pull that off? <laughs> uh, you know, and I can understand why the Vancouver Canucks wanted to ditch Kuzmenko because of just cap reasons, but like to me, this makes up for the Monaghan trade entirely. Um, you know, because Kuzmenko is not a bad player; he was just in a bad spit situation with the coaching staff. And as we've seen, you put him with the right people and, it, you know, instant production again. 
and you know he just was not clicking on Vancouver and like we've been able to take advantage of that situation wholeheartedly um and very similar to um Igor Sharangovich right he just wasn't fitting in where he was so the Flames took him and you know they're giving him a different set of chances yeah and realistically if uh Kuzmenko continues to play like this and uh bolsters Huberdo uh because that's a spillover effect and like both of them start clicking and playing well together th this might become a foundational player for this team unexpectedly as a mere cap throw-in and then on top of it like if you remove Kuzmenko from this trade I still view it as a win for this team Th that's just the cherry on top yeah, I mean, Kuzmenko was not the guy that if you and I were, you know, putting this on paper, guessing what was coming, I would not have expected Kuzmenko coming back, but it makes a lot of sense. Like you said, it's a cap throw, and I heard a lot of people say, oh, maybe they flip Kuzmenko. I don't think they're going to move him this year. If they flip him, it'll be a next year thing close to the deadline, but I just can't see them turning around and flipping him, especially with the success they're having with him now. Yeah, and realistically, you you know, like looking into next season, like you need to see what he is as a Flames player. And, you know, if he continues on how he was basically last season with Vancouver when he scored 39 goals, if he can basically effectively replace Lindholm's contribution offensively, then you look at offering him a contract just like you tried to Lindholm and you know see if that works or if not then you basically repeat the situation next trade deadline where you flip him for a first plus uh to some other team if they re-sign him i can't see him getting much more than he's making now like he's the kind of i think he's on kind of the max i'd pay him yeah the most I could see, like, if he bounces back to, like, 39-goal scorer version of Kuzmenko, I could see him getting, like, 7-ish million. 7 to 8 in that range, because he is more one-dimensional than Lindholm. But still, you know, like, that's... You know, if that works, then, hey, great, awesome. And, you know, you can figure it out, you know, beyond that. But, you know... Uh, I think, like, at worst, like, next year, like, if he just returns to the middling guy that he was this year with Vancouver, you're probably going to get a third-round pick for him, uh, presuming that that's what transpires. But, you know, if he's playing like a first-liner and the Flames need to sell off, like, you're looking at a first-plus in very much the same way. Yeah, and I mean, if he keeps playing as well as he is with Huberdo, you're going to find a way to keep him on the team because the flames have Huberto so much invested in him for so long that you're going to find a way to keep him there. You know, Sharon Govich down the middle, that line is looking like a line you don't want to break up. And right now I think the three of those guys, Huberto, Sharon Govich and Kuzmenko, this reminds me so much of the three M line from years ago where the line is better than the sum of its parts. I agree. And you know, they would try to move those guys and they just wouldn't look as good with anybody else. Yeah, and, you know, it's one of those things where if it ain't work, you know, if it's working and it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just let it run. Keep it going, <laughs> you know, and, you know, it just, yeah, like, and it seems to be really working over the last three games. Like, the power plays look dangerous for the first time in forever. And, you know, yeah, they've and the, scored. And three games is a tough thing to, you know, judge a line on. But so far, the early returns are showing that we may have finally found our sidekick for Huberto. Yeah. And realistically, uh, Huberto, like when he was with Florida and had the 115 point season, like he had uh, Duclair and Bennett, who are both quality finishers on that his line. And, you know, like they'd both crash the net and he'd basically throw the puck towards there and, you know, those guys would clean up the garbage. And what's Kuzmenko renowned for? Going in front of the net and cleaning up garbage. So, you know, it just fits exactly Huberto's style of play. So, you know, it's the right type of guy that he needs and hopefully it just continues. My thought on this trade, when it first came out, I thought it was what the Flames needed. Like, you can't get rid of... I don't think you can make the moves the Flames need to make and not take roster players back at this point. You need roster players, you need young guys, you need to take somebody's, you know, overpaid guys. You, you just need guys to play at the NHL level. So I, I didn't mind this. 
I think this is going to be a trade that is a gamble for the Flames because we don't know how these pieces are going to turn out, but it's a gamble worth taking. Even if none of these guys turn out and Kuzmenko finds, you know, what we need him to find with Huberto, I think right there, this trade is worth doing. Yeah. And, you know, then to go on to the prospects, Bruce Davich is an absolutely phenomenal offensive defenseman. And if there's one team that's able to teach offensive defensemen how to play defense, it's the Calgary Flames. Um, and, like, his numbers are equally comparable to uh, Jeremy Poirier, who was tearing up the AHL last season and this year in his brief time. He's back skating finally. And, you know, um, Briskevich is looking like, well, he is the top scorer in the, his league and one of the top scorers overall in his league even though he's a defenseman and you know like that's you know if he can translate into the nhl like the scouts compare him to the uh, you know the canadian hockey league's version of adam fox you know if he can become even remotely that good in the nhl level like that's a home run in, in and of itself and you know the other guy yeah. Yoni Yermo is a little more of a long shot prospect. He's playing over in the SM Liga for Cuckoo Kuvola. Um, he's 21 years old. This is a guy from everything I've heard. And if anyone wants to hear it, we actually have a bonus episode on our site at firesidechat.ca of me chatting with Sean, who covers the uh, covers the Vancouver Canucks for Shifts and Pucks. And we talked about this, the two of us. He has a lot more knowledge of this player. He says, you know what? He might end up being a 5'6 guy, might end up being AHL depth. But the more assets you get, the better off you have of one of them turn into something. Well, and that's what the way I look at it is like if you've got Kuznetsov, you've got Soloviev, you've got Yermo, you got to figure one of those guys turns into a dependable number 5'6 guy for you for the next five, six years. Just based on odds. Yeah, not everybody needs to turn into a, you know, one, two, three guy. And I would say even if Yermo could be a great AHL addition that, you know, helps drive the Wranglers forward because the Flames want that to be successful, you could say that's that's acceptable too. Yeah, and like realistically, like the Flames on their third pairing need guys that are big, physical, and decent. You know, they don't need to be world beaters themselves, but, you know, as long as they can clear the front of the net and play respectably at the NHL level, like uh, Gilbert has um, and uh, Pashal uh, in his few games, like, you know, it, that's what you need from your five, six guys. And having multiple prospects that are of that type, you know, One of those guys, you know, and if they hit a home run on those type of guys, you know, you've developed your own Chris Tanev type guy. And, you know, that becomes a really serviceable number four. But, you know, you just need to keep throwing darts at it until you get there. Yeah, I like that the Flames got defensive prospects because that's what they need right now. And I have to imagine they're going to work as hard as they can to get Yerma over to North America for next season. Oh, yeah. I think it's a foregone conclusion that the Flames will bring him over yeah it's one of those where because the flames uh, defense core is mostly on the younger side or under contract for a long time like Uyghur, um that this team can afford to not necessarily expend like higher draft pick assets on uh getting a defenseman right at this point in time where like they need a higher impact forward in the draft um moving forward uh, until they get like another like first line caliber yeah, but if guy. You've got two or I think they could end up with three first round picks. I could see it taking a Ford and a D man. Yeah. Uh, but it's one of those where uh, like if you're starting to stack your deck a bit with guys like uh, Etienne Moran, uh, Jeremy Poirier, uh, uh, Bruce Davich, you know, like where those guys, if they actually hit, like you've got a top four defenseman that's an impact offensive player like Shillington or Anderson, or Uyghur, you know, like, you gotta figure, similarly to the defensive guys, that you gotta figure one of those three guys will probably hit in some manner at the NHL level as well, and become a serviceable offensive defenseman, and so, you know, like, they're getting enough of a depth of a pool where, you know, you can kind of rely on some of these pieces turning out, even though some might not as well. You say the same about the forward group, too. 
Yeah, there's just the difference with the forward group is like they don't have like the true star caliber forward talent. I don't think. I don't know that they do on defense either. Frankly, the, that's where like I, I, I was mentioning to be a little bit more patient because like I consider Anderson and Weger to be star caliber talent. Sure, but that's not coming up through the pipeline. Those guys True. are in the NHL. Uh, yeah, but like they're young enough where you can be a little bit more patient and get in Sure, subsequent. but I mean, if you're saying that, then Coronado, I think, could be in that side on the forward side. Um, like, you know, I think they have just as many on the forward side if we're going with young NHLers as they do on the defensive side. True. I just, you know, I I don't see a, like a Ginla, Goudreau, Kachuk yet up front. No, but I but if we take out the guys that are already in the NHL, I don't see a top two guy coming up through the ranks. I don't know the Moran is that. I don't know the Poirier is that. Maybe, but I don't think either one's a slam dunk. No, I agree. So, you know, I think you've got to build both at the same time. To me, they have more young NHL-ready forwards like Coronado, like Peltier, that you can probably wait a couple years if you need to to insert another one into the lineup. Um, you'll have Hanzig in a couple of years. I think he'll be an NHL regular. Yeah. I think if it was me, I, I would probably be focusing more on defensive prospects right now. Yeah. And if we take two out, two of them out of the AHL, we're going to be back to nothing there. True. So I think that was good. I like this move when it was made. It reminds me a lot of the Jerome McGinley deal and that it was for futures for a big player. But I think these are futures that are a lot better than that one. And I think... I I still like it. Even a week later, I think both teams got what they needed. This was a hockey deal, and you could tell by how uh, far from the deadline it was going to be. Whether the Flames end up getting a home run with that first round pick is not really to me the issue because of where it is. I think you know as long as the pick gets how, close to the NHL. Yeah, how would you say it? like uh, the Flames? Like they've been so good in the first three rounds over the last decade. Uh, like pretty much starting in 2015 that, um, you know, like I'm not really concerned about having late first round picks or second round picks because like they've been really good at identifying players that are high quality prospects as long as they're in the top three rounds. And, you know, and uh, Craig Conroy was a big part of that. And now that he's GM, I think it could get even better because he's a very much a scouting minded GM. I agree. And, I just am grateful that uh, Conroy actually, you know, considering the Flames' proximity to the playoffs, had the cojones to actually make this trade, um, which, you know, we've seen previous general managers kind of skate by and, like, wait towards the deadline and, oh, well, hey, we're only two points out, so let's not trade anybody and shoot the team and the organization in the foot in the process. Yeah, I think he knows what's got to be done. Yeah. Which that's when, why I'm con- hoping that things continue down that road, regardless of where we're at in the short term. One thing that needed to be done was to find another defenseman. And you and I talked last time about the two guys the Flames lost on waivers. They did just that. They went out and got on waivers. Braden Pashal, who played in Vegas, uh, wearing number 94 for the Flames. Weird that we acquired a 94 and a 96 in the same week. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, Pashal's a 24 year old, six foot two defenseman from Saskatchewan, from Eviston, Saskatchewan, comes in here on a league minimum deal for this year and next year to play with the Flames. I heard people say when Pashal came in, oh, this guy's going to replace Tanev. He's not a Tanev replacement. He is a Nick Simone replacement. Yeah, he's a quality number six on a all-right NHL defense. Like, he's not a full-time NHLer in, well, he probably will be with us, but, like, you know, especially if the Flames move on from Hannafin and Tanev. But it, it's one of those where, you know, the Flames needed a serviceable NHL player, and they got a serviceable NHL player. Yeah, uh, and even if he ends up being a number seven, you know, next year, I think, you know, you don't need to go out and then get a guy like Osterly to fill that. You've already got that in-house. Exactly. And, you know, to in my mind, uh, trading D. Simone for Pashal is a win just because Pashal's five years younger. And, yeah. like, D. Simone's basically a finished product. You know, he's the your number seven. And, uh, you know, Pashal might turn into something more. Uh, he might end up being a Tanev replacement if he takes another step. But... You know, that's kind of on him, too. And, you know, at a minimum, he's basically what DeSimone is with upside, which when you're trying to get younger and, 
you know, uh, throw young NHLers in, sometimes they can surprise you and become more than you'd think. Yeah, and I don't even expect him to become anymore. Like, I think Pichal's pretty close to what he's going to be, and that's fine. You need guys who are good 5-6s, and I think he's shown he's a good 5-6. Yeah, and one of the better things that I liked about this acquisition was that he's been a leader on every team that he's been on, and he technically has his name on the Stanley Cup because he did play in the postseason when Vegas won. Don't you need to have so many regular season games to get your name on the Cup? Uh, Yeah, but he did play in the playoffs, and so they added him to the Cup. Interesting, okay. Yeah. I um, Teams have the option, but uh, they figured, well, hey – you know, you actually played during the playoffs, so, you know, get your name on there. Yeah, he's uh, he was the captain of the Prince Albert Raiders, captain of the Henderson Silver Knights for two seasons. This guy, like you said, shows a lot of leadership. He has a lot of playoff experience in even some AHL playoff experience, NHL playoff experience. He played one game that, uh, that playoff for the Vegas Golden Knights. I think this is... This is a good depth pickup, and the fact it costs us no asset, like, I like that Craig Conroy has found two really good depth pieces on waivers. Yeah, and then, you know, between him and A.J. Greer, like, they've basically helped to stabilize this team, frankly, yeah. as during this transition. Like, both of them are the type of players where they know their game, they go out and play it, you're not going to hear any BS, they just do what they got to do, and they do it. And, you know, you need serviceable role players on your team that have that right mindset. And, you know, anytime that I I figure that you can get players that have played decent roles on winning teams, that it benefits your team. Like, we saw the Flames get Blake Coleman, and he's been outstanding since we signed him. And, you know, guys like Greer and Pashal, you know, winning teams just have that right mindset. And, you know, getting players that are leaders on that team, even though they're depth players, you know, helps to rub off on everybody else to, hey, this is how you actually win at this level. And and I think that because, I mean, we're I think we're all high on seeing what Jeremy Poirier can be. He's lost almost a full season of, you know, time to injury. I think if nothing else, Pashal buys you a year before you've got to bring Poirier up. I think Poirier probably should play in the American League again next year um, just to pick up where he left off. And I think that's totally fine. I think a guy like Pashal just buys you that time, whether it's Poirier, Soloviev, Kuznetsov, any of those guys that are close to being ready. I think, you know, he's good enough. You don't need to force a guy from the AHL into your 5-6. Yeah, like the only realistic way I could see like Poirier or, you know, insert any of the other litany of guys here uh, into the lineup next year as if they move on from Hannafin and Tanev and do not get a solid replacement younger defenseman in one of those trades. Um, Yeah, and let's talk more about trades and returns closer to the deadline. Oh, of course. But I I would agree with you. I I think if one of those trades is made, you have to bring back an NHL defenseman. I agree. The last piece of news, I guess, from the last week um, that we haven't covered is Marty Pospisil gets re-signed. The Flames are making sure that he'll be around for a couple more years. Two years, $1 million per year. What do you think of that deal? Well, Conroy's like, hey, you punched Brad Marchand in the face. Here's a check. (laughs) I think this deal was technically done before that, but maybe there's an IOU. Yeah, here you go. (laughs) Here's two million bucks. Have fun. <laughs> Pending Pospisil can stay healthy. I think this is a good deal. I mean, he's gone from an AHL second, third line guy to an NHL second liner. Like, I think you're getting, uh, you're still, I think a million's the highest I would have gone from right now. And the Flames gave him that. The question is if he can stay healthy. Well, and the thing is, is that um, his game has evolved a lot over the years. And, like, when he first started with the Flames, like, he was basically a controlled rage ball. Um, <laughs> where, like, he would be fighting all the time and, you know, like, taking dumb penalties. Uh, aggressive penalties, you know, because he'd punch people in the face. Uh, <laughs> you know, oops, <laughs> sorry, didn't see you there. <laughs> but, you know, um, as, you know, he's matured, 
his game has evolved where he's become a really decent two-way player and you know he because of his size and his physicality he's able to easily create time and space for his line mates who capitalize regularly because of his activities yeah and and like you said he was when he first came in sort of a tough guy without a lot of depth to his game and he's really changed i'd say he's He's done what so many young players say they're going to do. Oh, they need me to play a certain way. I need to learn that. He very quickly learned how to be what the Flames need him to be and excelled at doing so. Yeah, and his career trajectory basically has followed the same path as Michael Furland in a lot of ways, where Furland, when he got drafted, basically was a tough guy with a good shot. And, you know, and Furland had to learn the rest of his game and incorporate it in order to become a solid NHL player and uh Pospisil is on that road and you know if he can remain healthy he can be a very effective player for this team and you can also tell with him uh that he's getting a little bit of a reputation around the league because everybody seems to hate playing him for some reason and every team needs a guy like that I mean without Kachuk that was a role that was open so I think that you know he's he stepped into that role and you need that guy yeah, and I do like that he wears a mirrored visor because it just adds a little bit onto the persona of being a Yeah, there's like bit... nobody else in the league that has a colored visor or a mirrored visor. It, it just, like you said, it sort of it reminds me of those guys you see who think that they're cool. They got those mirrored sunglasses <laughs> in the 90s. Yeah, like I'm I'm too good for you people. And <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Those like big, almost like the Bret Hart yeah. sunglasses. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it just... It adds to the persona. I think the last guy to wear a colored visor was Ovi. Yeah, that's exactly who I was thinking. And there have not been too many people to pull that off at the NHL level. And, no. Uh, you know, and it's nice to see him and his personality shining through on yeah, the scene. Yeah, do I think that Marty Postel is a career second liner? I don't. Um, I think on a competitive team, I think he's more of a third line guy, but he's a guy who has a distinctive role on this team. And I think he earned a million dollars because of that. He's not just, you know, winger number four that they're sticking in there. He earned a spot in the NHL and stayed in the NHL because he has a definitive role that he's played well. Yeah. And whether that continues and he continues to grow, uh, like Michael Furland, when he first got fo- called up, like he was not you know, he's a third, fourth line guy and eventually built upwards from there. Um, you know, Pospisil currently is playing on the second line effectively. Uh, you know, he might actually grow into being a second line forward, but you know, it's one of those where he seems to be doing all the right things and, you know, he's become a very effective two way player for this team. Yeah. And, He's had issues with injuries, and I think as long as he can stay healthy, there's a good deal. Um, and he's he's a guy, I think, this is so weird to say, he's a guy that will get a proper number next year. Like, he's getting paid a million bucks, he'll get his choice of whatever number he wants, sort of like Peltier. I agree. I can't see this kid sitting, staying with 76. You never know. I, I doubt it. I doubt we'll it, see. too. Um. We had a listener question here. Actually, a listen listener is also one of our friends, Kevin Olenek from Shifts and Pox. He sent in the Uyghur question and has another question for us. Kevin wants to know, when does when do the Flames try Zari at center? He's played center before. When do you think you see Zari become a center for this team? Um, Honestly, at this point, I don't really see it. With Sharon Govich playing effectively as your first line center, uh, at least for now, and Kadri and Backlund occupying the second and third line spots. Um, it, it's sort of like Elias Lindholm when he was with Carolina. Like they had enough good centers where he just did not play center very much until he came here. And like until there's a role where he's needed to play uh, center, I, I think that he's just fine being as a winger. And could he transition? Definitely. There's just no urgent need for him to do that right now. Yeah, I can see him being one of these guys that, you know, you play at center when someone gets hurt and you need a guy there. I don't see where you put him at center. Like you said, they've got some good centers right now. They've got Sharon Govich on line one. They've got 
Kadri, Backlund, and Rooney has taken the place I think you would have tried Zari at center. I, I don't know who you'd take out of center to put Zari in there. I think right now you need to, I think especially as a young guy, a young guy, you don't want to try him in too many positions. You want him to get good at where you want him in your lineup. And I think the Flames need him as a winger right now. Yeah, uh, that can change, but I don't see it being an imminent thing. No, At least right and, now. And I think that even if we need another center, there's other centers both in the organization um, at the HL level, you know, and guys you get that. I mean, where would Zari be as a center? He's not going to go on the first line. He's not going to replace Kadri. He's not going to replace Backlund. Like if you need a fourth line center, I think you can find somebody and use Zari better elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. And like realistically, like if you were say to trade either Kadri or Backlund for whatever reason, you know, like say they ask out or whatever, you can always get a center back for those guys. And, you know, and you're likely, go you know, in much the same way that like Lindholm was able to return a decent forward prospect or player, um, you know, like you would likely target getting at least a serviceable NHL center back. And yeah, I mean, even if you get a Rujishka quality player, but more reliable, you've got that fourth line center there. I mean, if I was the Flames, I'd just sign Rooney for another year in that position. Yeah. But I think if Connor Zari is your fourth line center, you're wasting that that asset. So I I can't see him moving. I think, you know, in a pinch, if someone gets hurt, sure. But I don't see why they would move Zari to center and where he'd fit. I agree. I think it also takes some pressure off him not being a centerman. Yeah, because he, he can just do his thing. Like, you, you see him driving the net and cleaning up a lot of garbage goals like he did this week and in, you know, previous games, um, where if he has to be the center, like, he's not going to be the guy to crash the net. And, you know, you're taking a little bit of a weapon out of his arsenal. Um, and, he, you know, he's a f being very, you know, much like Pospisil, he's being very effective in the role that he's in. And it's you know, much like the first line currently, it's like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So, you know, just kind of let it rip. That line seems to be one of the best lines in the NHL right now. Just kind of let it rip until it's not. And, you know, <laughs> then play around if you yeah, need Yeah, I mean, to. May maybe try him at center, you know, in the preseason or something next year. But right now, I think he's where he needs to be. Yeah, entirely. Talking about Sharon Govich, though, I mean, do you think that Sharon Govich is, do you think that his spot on this roster is as the centerman on that line? Or do you think that's a temporary thing until they find somebody else? Um, He can do that serviceably. And, like, how would you say, the Flames do not have a first-line center in the organization. Kadri is a very good, exceptional number two center. They don't have a first-line center. Nor are they going to go out and spend the assets to get one. No, because it, it literally makes no sense. Like, unless they go and sign Dreisaitl or McDavid or something in the offseason when they become available. Like, yeah, it, I don't even know why those guys would come here because this is a, a retooling team. Exactly. Like, there's no realistic option other than through the draft. So, basically... And even that'll take a couple years. Yeah, so it's one of those where he'll do <laughs> for where the flames are at right now. I think he's fine. And if he can, you know, if, if he can sort of up level himself because of Huberto and Kuzmenko, I still think that Lindholm looked better than he should have when he played with Goudreau and Kachuk. I think that could be the same thing here with Sharon Govich. He's looking better because of his line mates. Just keep him there for now. You can always move him around later. Um, but you know, I think he's as good a center as anybody else at this point. I agree, and... You're not going to put Zari there. No, and it's one of those where you kind of just have to run with the personnel you have, and... Yeah. Yeah, that, that's part of the problem of being a rebuilding, retooling team, is that not everybody is going to be in the ideal situation for them. And that is also fine. That's part of the reason why you're rebuilding and retooling. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those where you just kind of have to wait and see and hope for the best. And he's a right-handed center, too. I think it's nice to have another righty there. I agree. 
So, yeah, no, I have no problem with Sharon Govich. I think, you know, the fact he started the year on the fourth line and has worked his way up to 1C, I think it says a lot about this player and his character as well. I agree. Um, I guess that's probably it for Flames news. Anything else Flames related that I forgot? Um, not really. Uh, it's been a eventful week, but uh, I think we're at the end of that. <laughs> I think we are. So before we get to our predictions, Matt, you and I have talked a lot about our disdain for the All-Star game, and you you would not be surprised. We had about six fans write in to us, either email or social media, giving the same thoughts, that this thing's become a circus, especially as they watched it play out. The Michael Bublé mushrooms thing and all this, people were saying this is making a mockery of the sport. Well, we've learned the NHL is going to make some changes. The NHL will be returning to Olympic play starting in 2026, and the Winter Olympics are every four years. Every two years between it, the All-Star break will be used for a World Cup, a best-on-best World Cup. We'll be starting this next year in 2025 with the Four Nations Cup instead of the All-Star Game. So you and I don't like the All-Star Game. How do you feel about uh, international play instead? Anything is better than what that was. <laughs> Literally, you know, any, it, not it, having it would be better than that. Yeah, well, oh, gee, McDavid uh, designed the skills competition. And who won the skills competition? Oh, guess what? It's Connor McDavid. What a shock. You know. And oh, where'd that million dollars go? Oh, right in his pocket instead of donating it to charity. Just that's what it, it should have been. Like anytime you very see, chintzy. Anytime you see like you know celebrities playing Family Feud or something like that, they're always playing for a charity. They should have been playing for a charity. Yeah, like that was extremely chintzy. Like, and I would have loved to have seen like a patch on their jersey showing what what charity they're playing for. Yeah, like uh, that would have been the better approach instead of. Oh well, I I'm in it for the bucks and thanks. Like it, it, it just, yeah. Like it makes me like him even less than I already did. <laughs> Which you know, I did not really like McDavid beforehand, and you know, it's like that's really scummy. Like you you specifically design it to you know kind of your specifications. You win it just to get a million bucks. It's like, yeah, like that's. Like, how many dollars do you need at that point? Like, really, you're getting yeah. paid, what, 13, 14 million a year? Like, yeah, like it, I was it's just, just watching, bad. I was just watching Family Feud, and they had a bunch of actors on it, and they were all playing for somebody. Like, if you win, you know, this charity gets the money. I've seen the same thing on other game shows. Like, it should be the same here. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like, even back to, like, who wants to be a millionaire and all those kind of things. Like, anytime a celebrity is on anything, it's for whatever the charity is exactly. and like it, it's just like it you know and even like a few years ago when uh the three flames were on it um and they won uh the the pacific division won the all-star game and they got like five hundred thousand dollars they all donated it to chris snow's foundation you know which you yeah. know because the uh, you know, at that all-star game, everybody was wondering why the Flames players were trying really hard. <laughs> and, you oh, know, well, I mean, hey. if that happened this year, and let's say one of the Flames won it, and they said, I'm going to donate to Snowy, you know darn well the Calgary Flames would have said, we'll match it. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it's just a lost opportunity for both, like, him, the Oilers, you know, and the NHL to get some good, positive you know, publicity from, you know, that kind of a thing. And, you know, instead it leaves anybody going like that. That's really chintzy. <laughs> like it just, you know, well, moving away from the all-star game, uh, best on best international play. I'm excited for this. I think it's going to be fun. I think we're going to see a higher level of play. We're not going to see the same goofiness. And I have my own thoughts about them leaving Russia out. I think there's a way you could find to keep Russia in the tournament. If you don't want it to be Team Russia, they could do Team World or something like that, like we've seen in the past, to get some of those guys in there, even guys from other countries. But I'm, I think this is an awesome way to, to showcase the best players out there. Yeah, you know the the All Star Game is not always that. They're making sure there's one representative from each team. That's not going to happen here. There's going to be you know the best of each country facing off against each other for more than one game. It'll be a tournament format, so you'll get to see multiple guys over multiple days. I'm excited for this. I agree. And... I'm not. I don't know that the Four Nations Cup is going to be what we want it to be, 
but I think 2026 will be the start of really good international hockey. I agree. Um, you know, it's, I think it'll be a lot of fun to see. I think the European guys, I heard, I forget what NHL said. It maybe it was Ovi, but he said, you know, NHL players grow up wanting to hoist the Stanley cup, Russian kids. And a lot of the European guys grow up wanting to win the Olympics. So I think there's going to be, especially in the 2026 year, there's going to be a lot of guys out there that are playing really hard to represent their country. You're going to see far better hockey. I do worry about more injuries. That's the only thing here. But I also think that this could be a really cool way to showcase the game. Like the NHL, and I know they won't do it because it's a mid-season tournament and it would take too much out of these guys. But, you know, they start the season in different, like, you know, play in Sweden. It'd be cool if they moved the whole tournament over to one of those countries. Yeah, and it's one of those where, like the NHL, frankly, since uh, Crosby's gold medal winning goal, like has missed the Olympics dearly. Um, just fans of the sport period of seeing a legit, you know, best on best. And like you see in baseball now that they have the world baseball classic in the preseason where, you know, it's literally all the people from various countries going at it. And like, uh, there's been nothing like that in the NHL. The difference slightly though is that like guys in baseball from the Japanese leagues and stuff play. This unless we're talking about the Olympics is not going to have all the other leagues going to be the best angelers from each country. Yes. Well, uh most of the Japanese players actually had Japanese heritage like it wasn't uh For sure, but I mean some of them are playing in the Japanese league. They're not necessarily in the MLB. Yeah, true. But um well, and you see that with some nations as well like uh you know, some of the well, frankly, mediocre teams will have guys from like the German league or, mm-hmm. you know, insert miscellaneous random, you know, European league as well. So not necessarily, you know, NHL caliber. Cause a lot yeah. of those teams don't, you know, like the seven, eight guys in the team roster, like they don't have 20 guys that are actually NHL players. No. And, and I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see play um, Olympic hockey again. Oh, same here. Like, I don't know. I don't know what to expect from the World Cup till we see it. But I'm excited for Olympic hockey. Yeah, the the, At, the World Cup thing. It, it's kind of just okay. Uh, you know, it, it it's they not haven't the same. released the rules yet, and I wouldn't put it past the NHL to do something dumb like make it a three on three tournament. Probably. Um, it, it'll but, be, I, I'm expecting that to be a gong show, frankly, because it seems that like any time the NHL's in charge of an event. It's stupid. Um, yeah. Just, you know, because... Matt, what do you think this does to the world championships in the summer? I think you're going to cannibalize those. Uh, to an extent, but I think that there's enough people, you know, especially with the best teams, that you're not necessarily going to have the same guys playing in both events. Um, well, that's what I mean. I think, like, you know, in the past, we've sometimes had the best players in Canada who aren't in the playoffs going to play in the world championships, I think this will at least give you more time to look at some of the lesser known guys. You'll get guys like Walker Dewar. You'll get guys like, well, like that. Manjapane going... when he was there a couple of years ago. Yeah. Maybe a guy like Manjapane, a guy like Peltier or Rooney or, you know, Coleman who might not make your Olympic team going over there and getting a, a really good look at those guys. So I think in some ways it gives you two tiers of, of best on best. It kind of gives you, what I'll call the bottom six tournament and the top six tournament. Yeah, exactly. And that way you can really determine how to fill out your roster. Cause if say like a Blake Coleman really tears the cover off of it, then you know that, Oh, well, Hey, this guy might be a really good fourth line player for team USA in the Olympics where, you know, normally that guy would not get a normal shot at it. And even if he doesn't go to the Olympic team, you know, he still gets to represent his country. Yeah. It's not like it's going to be okay. Just the, you know, just the Olympic guys are really not the Olympic guys. The Spangler cup is really all we've got now. And honestly, in the last Olympics, those are pretty much same roster. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm excited for the possible. I'm excited for the Olympics. I'm excited for the possibility of the world cup. I would love to see the world cup have some sort of skills competition though. Like that's the thing I like about when it's done right the uh the all-star game and i'd like to see that in there somewhere yeah 
And I'm hoping that the distance will make the heart grow fonder with the all-star game. Like we're getting it every other year. I'm hoping that it doesn't have to be as silly for, you know, the, no, the league to get and that like, take up. Realistically, the NHL needs to go back to a five on five all-star game. Uh, Cause it's stupid and unwatchable uh, in the three on three. Like I watched part of it just to say I watched it and the third game of it. And like, it's like, okay, yeah, woo, somebody got a breakaway. And another guy got a breakaway. And then another guy got a breakaway. Like, it, yep. it's not hockey. Like, like, it's not showcasing the sport at all. And it just feels stupid. No, and I think it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be hard for them to say to fans on every even numbered year, we play five on five this way. On every odd numbered year, we play three on three this way. Like, I think that's going to get very confusing for the average fan. I think you're going to have to play, you're going to have to start playing by NHL rules. Yeah, like, it, it just feels stupid, the, the whole game, and it, it's just not worth watching. And, you know, like, I, 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 I was bored watching the three-on-three -three part in the third period of that game, and it's like I was literally counting down the minutes until it was over. And, you know, like, prior to the game, I'm like, oh, the one team has four Leafs on it. Of course they're going to lose, and they ended up winning it. But, uh, you know, it, it just... No part of it is interesting when it's like that in that format. I can see the league, not right away, but I could see by, let's say, 2030, transitioning and not having an all-star game. And on those years between international play, just having a break. Yeah, I agree. Well, especially if because... These, if you got the top players who are playing again, then they're not going to get the break. Everybody else is. I can see them saying, well, that's not fair to me. I want a break, too. Yeah, and realistically, like, the three-on-three -three tournament, like, all-star games are bad enough where, like, nobody's really trying that hard. But making it three-on-three, -three, it, it's just sloppy and unprofessional. And, like, this is supposed to be a showcase of your sport. And, you know, like, if I'm an average fan, I'm going, A, this is boring. B, these players are the best, supposedly, and they're playing, like, absolute trash. There's no stakes in the game. Like, you know, like at least three on three in the regular season, hey, we get an extra point in the standings, mm -hmm. you know, and there's like a legit effort from the players that are playing. In this, it's like, you know, seeing some doofuses that are in your beer league just messing around for 10 minutes. And, it, and it's just not interesting at all. And if I'm an advertiser, which is really what the NGL cares about, I think I'm going to say, why spend my money on that when I can spend my money on the World Cup? Yeah. If I'm Scotiabank or whoever, you know, they want to sponsor Tim Hortons, why spend my money on this when I can spend my money on the World Cup, which more people are going to be interested in? I would love to see, and the NHL is a fascination with outdoor games. I would love to see one of these uh, international tournaments played completely outdoors. It yeah, won't I, happen, but I'd love to see it. Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, if as, especially if you had like two sites for it. One thing I will say is probably going to work in our favor. By the time this gets going, the NHL will have the Flames new building in circulation and they tend to like to highlight their new buildings. So I would be very surprised if by, let's say, 2032, we do not see the Flames hosting a World Cup. Yeah, or an All-Star game or both. Yeah, I'd rather they don't host an All-Star game. Well, you know that they'd probably, oh, well, it's Calgary. Here, you can have the Ulster game. <laughs> Maybe. I, I, but, you know, I could see doing like the World Cup Calgary-Edmonton together. Yeah, I agree. And doing something like that. Um, no one's going to be hosting the draft anymore because of the new format, so we won't get a draft. Oh, I know. But Which we, I still uh, hate. But it makes sense from a logistics point of view. It's just as a fan of the draft, it's like, oh, well, it's like watching the NBA draft, which is not exciting at all <laughs> so you know which is fine because you know you'll be be paying attention for whenever your team picks but it's also like um why am i watching this then <laughs> you know well let's just, talk more about the draft format when we get closer to july oh i agree it's just one of those that like i just hate that decision it's so the one last of the thing things along with the all-star game format is like one of the other things that has really irked me about the NHL this season. So, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I, well, again, we'll talk more about the draft later. I don't want to go too long with that now. That's a long way from now. But I I think once we get used to it, it's not going to be that bad. True. Just more boring. Um, could be. We'll see. We don't know what that format's going to look like. We know what other leagues have done, but we don't know what it'll look like when the NHL does it. So let's let's wait and see. I think it, I think it could be more interesting because you'll get a lot more local content. Like I could see filling the dome with, you know, Flames fans for it. Well, well, and, you know, not just filling the dome for them, but having them there as the pick is made. Like I can see it being a lot more fun for local fans. Yeah. But let's wait and see. Um, one thing we will wait and see as well is this week if the Flames can extend their win streak. Matt, you and I did not do well in these predictions. I thought we'd lose all three. You thought we'd win to Boston, lose to New Jersey and New and the Islanders, which based on what we saw going into that all-star break was probably reasonable. Yeah. Well, and I, I even said last week that, or last show that, uh, you know, I'm only picking Boston because it would be absolutely hilarious because we always suck in Boston and they're awesome and we are not. So that's why I picked them specifically. Ended up, you know, <laughs> being right on that, which, you know, <laughs> I'm amazed, <laughs> frankly. I still can't believe they pulled that one off and, me, you know, got the other two. So, sure, why not? The Flames are... The Flames are ending their uh, their Eastern road swing on Monday. It's a 5 p.m. game against New York Rangers in Madison Square Garden. Then they have a couple days off, and they'll be coming home on the 15th. They'll be taking on the sh- the Sharks in the Saldome, back to a regular 7 p.m. start time. And then Saturday, the 17th, a 2 p.m. start time against Detroit. How long do you think this win streak goes on for? Uh... I'm going to decide to flip the coin and be optimistic and say it'll be at least a seven-gamer. So you think they win all three? Yeah, sure, why not? They'll probably do the exact opposite because I said so. But now that you've said it, they're going to lose, Matt. Now yeah. that you've said it. Yay, draft pick. No, wait. <laughs> not an well, Oilers fan. <laughs> we, we get a draft pick either way. It's just a matter of where that pick is. Yeah. Yeah, I I really... It, it's hard to tell because the Rangers kind of are struggling even though they're a good team. San Jose is just a tire fire. And Detroit's kind of in that middle zone just like we are. So all three, I think, are coin flips because the Flames usually suck against bad teams and then are good against decent ones. So... If I had to pick one where they'd lose for sure, it'd probably be the Detroit game because, you know, that makes more sense. But see, and and this team tends to not do well when they come home from a road trip. So that leads me to believe they might lose to San Jose. Well, it's just that San Jose is just so bad that, you know, except for the, the time that they beat Edmonton, which was hilarious. But, you know, yeah, I. And My gut says they'll beat the Rangers. I think they've got a lot going for them. I think they're going to make sure they beat the Rangers. Well, and you got to figure that the players that are wanting out, uh, not necessarily wanting out, but like likely to get traded or auditioning for other teams as well. So they're going to be giving it their all in each of the games. And like we've seen both Hannah Infant and Tanev and Marks from all three being exceptional uh, over the last week as well. So, you know, it's one of those where that could very well continue. Yeah, they've just got so much going on now. And I mean, how often do you see it where, you know, they're looking good and then they're on a ro- you know, they're on a winning streak and that winning streak you start to see cracks in the armor and you know it's going to end. Yeah. We're not seeing that with the Flames. Like they are looking as good in the in the Islanders game as they were in the Boston. I don't want to say the first game, the Chicago game, but in the Boston but, game. Yeah. I know it's hard to tell like uh, you know and like maybe something's changed in the organization attitude wise and you know that's spurring them on maybe the found chemistry between Kuzmenko and Huberdeau is powering them it's kind of one of those who knows but you know you ride it until it you know dies on its own don't ask questions yeah be happy (laughs) yeah I I also think that Kuzmenko is going to want to play really well when he comes home for the first time to the flames so um, I'm going to go, 
I'm going to say that this game, they will win against the Rangers. They'll win against the Sharks. I think they're going to end up having this come to an end against Detroit, sadly. Yeah. That works for me. Do you think Vladar plays this week? No, I think he's out for a while still. So. Okay, do you think Wolf plays this week? Uh, Probably the San Jose game. I would do the same. I would I would put him in. We didn't talk about that, but yeah, Dan Vladar is out on the IR. Wolf is up uh, as the backup. First time we've had a Wolf Markstrom pairing. He's been Markstrom out all year. Every time that he's come up. So yeah, I, I totally think they want to get Wolf in a game. What a better time to do it than San Jose. He's used to playing against HL talent. Yeah, it's playing against the Barracuda. So um, maybe <laughs> can even get dressed in the HL room. Yep. <laughs> make it feel like he's at home. But yeah, I I, th- I think you have to play him. Um, and I think that's the one I'd play him in. Yeah, makes the most and, sense, especially like if you're vying for a playoff spot. You know, you're not gonna want Markstrom to be playing against the bad teams. You're gonna want him playing against the the tough teams to give it his all. And, um, yeah, so any time that the Flames are playing against weaker teams, I could see Vladar or Wolf, depending on health, uh, drawing in. Yeah, and if you contests. think you're going to make it to the playoffs, you've now got to start, you know, managing your goaltender minutes. Yeah, and that's where, like, any time you're getting a bit of a breather game where, you know, a lesser opponent in the middle of some better opponents, you throw them in in the lesser and let it rip. Does your hunch, I I think we're all waiting for at least one big trade to happen between now and March 8th. Does your, do you have a hunch that happens this week or do we talk this time next week and we have the same Flames roster intact? I could see, like, if they're going to move Tanev, I think they're going to do it sooner than later. So I, that would be the guy I would expect if they're going to trade somebody, that would be the guy that would be dealt first. Um, Not necessarily this week, but I would expect it by like the following week at the latest. The I don't. They, they leave Tana back east and come home without him. Could very well be. Um, it's one of those where uh, I think that like having a couple days between the Rangers game and the Sharks game, that uh, you know it would make more sense for that deal to happen at that point. Um, and Hannafin, uh, the contract negotiations have been happening and you know the flames have given the number and blah 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 if, he, when, if it's literally conroy says that he hannafin has a decision to me if hannafin had decided he wanted to resign we'd see that already yeah and so like, that, what are you waiting for to announce it i have to imagine the decision is we're moving on yeah which then it's like that particular trade is a little bit more complicated uh just because you know, like it might be one of those sign in trades where, you know, because the acquiring team can't sign them to an eight year deal. Uh, they can only sign them to a seven year deal. So it'd be trusting Calgary to sign the guy and then flip them just to get the eighth year um, at whatever dollar, yada, 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 yada. So, like, first you got to negotiate the actual framework of the trade with whichever team you're dealing with, then negotiate the number. Then, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's, then make the trade. So, like, that, it just from a logistics point of view, like, that takes a lot more than, oh, Tana for a second round pick plus. You I know. think that this time next week, we still see the same Flames roster intact. So, it'll be the same Flames time, same Flames channel next week? Exactly. <laughs> Let's leave on that. And as always, go Flames, go. <laughs> Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.